take what we've learned over the last uh, day or so and, and, and translate that into clinical practice. So without uh, further ado then, I want to thank Amanda for uh, in, inviting uh, or in, suggesting that we invite uh, Jace Ward and his, uh, and his mom, uh, Lisa, to come and join us about their uh, research story. Uh, and I'll leave it to Jace to tell the rest of that. So hello, my name is Jace Ward. I'm a 20 year old kid from Kansas and I'm about to know when they come. I'm the youngest in a very healthy family. Um, my mom and dad, um, they both have good jobs, very good health insurance, and I took all of that for granted until about May. In May, after a car accident I was able to walk away from, I noticed some uh, double vision in my left eye. Um, I wasn't sure what it, uh, what it was. I thought it was just uh, maybe something from the accident. And so I didn't think twice about it for a few months until finally I just decided to get it checked out. Um, I went in and shortly after followed a CT scan and, and an MRI and I was told I had a mass in my brain. We immediately went to MD Anderson where I was told um, I could get the best imaging and talk to the best doctors about um, what I could do moving forward and what, what I was gonna, my life would look like, I guess. So after MD Anderson, uh, we reached out to tumor board to follow up with my images and all of them came back with me telling me I need a biopsy. And I didn't even know what that meant. They, they told me that a biopsy would tell me what I have. Um, and at the time, I didn't even know I had DIPG. And so I, I said, yeah, I guess that looks like what, what I'm gonna do. I'm not too scared of it. Um, let's just get it going. So let's, let's refresh. I'm normal as of May 16th. May 17th, my entire life gets uplifted and sent to Houston, Texas. And then uh, May 20th order. And then June 5th, I'm sitting in a waiting room getting ready for a biopsy. And um, as a 20 year old with um, just only the advice of my mom to kind of get me through, it's incredibly scary. I had, um, when I was in the waiting room for my biopsy, I had about 10 minutes to decide whether or not I was going to take additional samples um, from my tumor. And the way they explained to you that was, the doctor doesn't feel um, like taking more than six samples is even safe for me. He thinks that there would be a lot more side effects if he did that. He's gonna take at least four, and I've gotta decide if the, the extra two are worth the quoted 35,000 for genome sequencing that only works about 30% of the time. That's the reality of what you're told as a patient. And you only have about 10 minutes to make these decisions. Now don't get me wrong, the doctor made a patient-centered decision not to encourage me to risk uh, more samples without the likelihood of using the info. But the point is that the decision was made in 10 minutes before the, the, the <coughs> The decision was made in 10 minutes, and it was about 15 minutes before I went in for a brain biopsy. It's not the best, best time to be making these decisions, and we need to do better on allowing people to have time and understand what they're deciding. So now we fast forward to June 24th. Um, I get a random email um, quoting that I have an update on my chart, and my chart is basically the way that, uh, as a patient, I'm able to talk to my doctor and kind of get updates. And so I got an email and I opened it and uh, it happened to be my genomic sequence, or it happened to be uh, my genomic data. It had all of my mutations and um, I didn't have the slightest clue what I was looking at. After you know a few hours of Google research and um, my mom talking to her Facebook friends, I sort of realized that I had my worst nightmare. I had DIPG. And um, I basically had to face that alone. I was scared. Um, finally, two days later, we were able to uh, talk to our doctor from UCSF, and they basically said that my options are radiation, chemotherapy, and then to look at clinicaltrials.gov um, for future, where I, see where I wanna go, what looks good to me, and basically didn't use my mutations on helping me decide that at all. So, at that point, I'm sitting there, 20 years old, with a hole in my head, just you know, wondering why even biopsies? Why is it important for me to have 
about this to know data. Why do I? Why would I want to do that? During my biopsy process, I had to relearn how to walk and relearn how to use my right arm. Like that, that is not worth going through if I'm just going to go through chemo and radiation, just like if I didn't biopsy. Um, <clears throat> so, what happens? Or let me, let me catch myself back up. Sorry. Um, so. When I was sitting there thinking through those questions, you know, that's that's when I really felt alone. That's when I felt like there wasn't much help for kids in my situation. My parents were looking at every end of the earth trying to figure out what might save their child, but the answer is without understanding what my genomic data is, there's really not much of an option besides just go with what's best. And so um, luckily we were able to um, speak to a doctor who helped us you know, understand what our genomic data was and understand why um, we got a biopsy and understand that, you know, there are certain clinical trials that would work better than others. <clears throat> you know, that uh, when it comes to DIPG, there are, you know, about 300 to 500 a year. Um, but that's 300 to 500 new patients every single year. The clinicians aren't really on the top of what's going on in all of these clinical trials. They don't understand um, what other clinical trials are doing because they're not reported quick enough. And so uh, we called the primary investigators for a few different clinical trials knowing that um, we may not get the success that we were looking for, but luckily this is a tight-knit DIPG community. And luckily that every single one of those investigators were able to stay up throughout all hours of the night and call and email on their spare time just to be able to talk to us and kind of find us an answer. Um, so that finally after finding, you know, calling 15 to 20 of the top doctors, we had the idea of what a market would look like after radiation and chemo. For some, a biopsy at their hospital was required. For others, radiation had to start in 30 days of a diagnosis. So we barely made that, you know, we barely understood that um, if I didn't start radiation within 30 days of May 17th, then I wouldn't be qualified for the clinical trial that I'm on now, and I wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm able to do. I probably wouldn't look as good as I do as right now. Uh, so even with the best facilities at UCSF and uh, MD Anderson and a few others, I, it's very tough on the patient to make these decisions um, without somebody kind of guiding us. The, these oncologists know what I'm getting, like they understand my disease, but they don't understand how to help yet, and that's where we need to <coughs> focus our efforts. <sighs> so, I had to make sure my info was shared between different hospitals and different oncologists, and to do that, I would have to literally go pick up a disc um, that would have my imaging and my mutations and everything on it, and I would have to either send it in the mail or physically take it to my next location. Um, it wasn't, they wouldn't share it for us, they wouldn't, you know, help us with that. They would just say, you either you have to come here and pick it up and send it in the mail yourself, or you have to come here and pick it up and drive it yourself. Um, so luckily we were going, or luckily we were able to um, mail my data all the way to Europe and to up to a few different doctors um, to help us kind of figure out you know, what, would, what it would look like after I got done with radiation because at the time I had, I had no clue and I was very scared and very sick. Um, but uh, our research was through talking with these doctors in their spare time and then talking to moms on Facebook. You know, that's where most of our, that's where most of the DIPG community can speak to each other, simply because the, there's not, not a good way for us to find other DIPG patients and find other people who kind of know the situation other than Facebook talking to parents and children who died. And so parents were very good to us. They sent their UCSF 500s, um, they sent their genomic data to us just so we can match up and kind of figure out um, if there's any similarities, if I should try what they tried, if um, what they tried didn't work at all, and so I can't do that. Um, it was, it's, <laughs> I, I, just to say, I would never do a, you know, a research project researching on Facebook, but now I'm you know, gonna choose 
the decision that will ultimately, you know, save me or kill me through what these parents are talking on Facebook. And so, uh, I mean, as you can imagine, the stress of that's just uh, unbearable. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I guess one, th one point I really want to drive home is, you know, why do parents trust Facebook? You know, why would, uh, uh, why would I make, why would I make such a point to talk to all these parents um, if I'm just going to uh, be learning it through Facebook? Like, social media and nothing that they say can really be backed up or proven. Um, it's because VIPG won't wait. It's got a very short, well, it's a very aggressive tumor, and about five months ago, I was given nine months to live. DIPG won't wait to take my mobility, it won't wait to take my voice, it won't take, wait to take my sight, and it won't wait to take my life. So I don't care that 20 researchers have my data. I want, I want a treatment, you know, if I, if I try one and it disqualifies me from another, that's okay, at least I'm able to make decisions, um, you know, at least I'm able to make some decisions rather than sitting here not doing anything and just chemo and radiation and whatever looks good. I'm able to make a knowledgeable decision on moving forward that I can at least try to trust. <laughs> <clears throat> Within one to two weeks of diagnosis, I have to make all of the decisions that really matter um, in my course uh, after DIPG. I have to decide if I'm gonna biopsy, if I'm gonna do radiation and chemotherapy, and when I'm gonna do that, and I've gotta decide what kind, of, uh, what kind of clinical trial I'm gonna be aiming for after radiation. And then I just have to pray that my um, labs come back good. I mean, if I have a low blood count, then I won't be accepted for any type of clinical trial. So I have to pray that I do okay, and luckily I did. <sighs> I wanna make sure that we all understand that I, I get risk. I work at a law firm. I understand um, that I needed to make exceptions to what I was signing as far as consents. I understand that um, not everybody's going to be using my information to try to cure me. But the way I see it is it's like a financial transaction. In the olden days, we all used a bank, and whenever we needed to make a purchase, we would go to the bank, we'd take our money out, and we'd go make a purchase. But recent, or, but I mean, since I've been alive, we've always had debit cards, which they, you take them around, they share your financial data at every single place you swipe them, and, uh, we, they are risky, but I think we, we assume that risk when we understand the convenience of being able to swipe that card and not having to carry cash everywhere. And so in my personal situation, um, I, I wish I could swipe my you know, genomic data everywhere. It doesn't matter to me if China's gonna use it to, you know, uh, you know, or use it against me or discriminate me for me in some way. I really don't care as long as somebody can use it to find a cure either for me or for someone shortly after me because while we're sitting here deciding whether or not it's okay for people to share their own uh, genomic data, you know, 300 kids are dying every single year. 300 to 500 and they're going without a voice. <clears throat> So the, I guess I want to end my speech off with a few points that I really want to drive home. And the, the, point, the main one is, you know, 300 kids a year lose 70 years of life on average because we don't incentivize and monetize sharing our research with each other in real time. And two, we require too many kids and a child to move forward and to uh, further phases of the trial. There's not enough kids in, that get DIPG to get the thousand kids needed in order for a trial to move forward. And three, our clinicians don't know where to send our patients. Our, when, I, our, when a clinician receives a patient with a rare disease, um, they, they try to help them out, but like they really don't know what they're doing. And so, you know, Facebook is the only place we have to do. 
So we really have to do better for this group. You know, government funding must build a better comprehensive data repository that one, research can access, and two, patients can access, can access differently, but they still be able to access it. <clears throat> As the owner of my data, I can determine my risk and I can nav navigate um, the database and I can choose who gets my data. And finally, at my death, I get to pick who offers for, for further use of my information and my data. For me, we don't have time to work through this. <clears throat> or for me, we don't have time to work through the risks. For uh, me and my boss, sorry, I cannot read my own hand. <laughs> for me, we don't have time to work through the multitude of risks. For me, I'm in the bad class lane and I need a fast track to cures. So to make it work better, we need clinicians to be trained in accurate but empathetic delivery, and we need data to be shared freely with some restrictions. Thank you.